That's what I'm talking about. Night Church is the right church. Amen? Amen. All right. Man, we are so excited to be with you. First off, if you're new, let me introduce myself. My name is Mike. I have the wonderful honor of being the lead pastor here at Bloom. But more importantly, I am so honored I get to spend my Sunday with you. I hope you feel welcomed, loved, and at home tonight. Got a couple quick announcements, and I'm going to dive right in the message. First off, this is the first Sunday of the month, which means it's baptism Sunday going down tonight. Come on. So if you've accepted Jesus in your life, that next step is to go public with your faith and get water baptized. Jesus commanded it. Jesus demonstrated it. And if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Amen. And so we want to encourage you to take that next step. And we want to celebrate with you. So after service, you have that opportunity to go public with your faith. And guess what? You don't have to worry about having no change of clothes. You're, some of you come in like, oh, I got what I'm wearing. Guess what? We will hook you up. We got some shorts. We got some shirts. We got some clean underwear, brand new underwear. They're not used, I promise. Come on. You can grab them right outside that Welcome Center. We will take care of you. Don't let excuses rob you from obedience. Amen? Secondly, next Sunday, going down at 315, is Growth Track Connect 1. If you've been wanting to take that next step to get plugged in and start serving here at Bloom, then you need to go through Grow Track and get a part of the team. And we would love to serve alongside you week in and week out because we better with you than without you. And during week one, I get to share the heart and the vision of our church. And I'd love to spend that moment with you. So be there next Sunday, 315 next door. And lastly, but not least, today is day one of 21 days of prayer. Come on. Man, I love 21 days of prayer. If you don't know what 21 days of prayer is, twice a year we carve out a time where we pray as a community for 21 days straight. We partner with churches all over the world, and we get here, man, Monday through Friday. We're here from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., and we're going to fill this place. It's going to be packed to capacity tomorrow. It's going to be powerful. We pray on Saturdays like normal at 9 a.m., and then we minister out of the overflow. And I want to encourage you, don't let the time scare you off because it is so powerful powerful and man it is so unifying when we come together and we are just seeking God and we are saying God for 21 days you come first every ounce of me man and I'm tired it gets long towards the end but I'm pressing through and I've yet to see God not do the miraculous to those that are willing to go in there and let God be everything so be here 21 days of prayer starting tomorrow tomorrow 6 a.m. love to see you guys there all right guys we are picking up a series that we started at the beginning of the year we took a little pause during At The Movies called The Year of the Bible. And this is a commitment we made as a church. We're going to read through the entirety of the Bible together as a church. And every week we're going to speak on something we pulled from that text that we read from. And if you're new here, you may say, well, man, I wish I would have started with you. I wish I would have been able to be caught up. Well, guess what? We got your back because every single month we print off these bookmarks that has a reading plan attached to it. And so all you have to do is grab one of these bookmarks. You can get them on all the shelves out in the hallways, the Welcome Center, the Black Tent outside. They're everywhere. Grab one, find a day's date and start. And then next Sunday, you're going to be fully caught up and we can end the year together. Man, reading the word of God. How powerful is that? But tonight, I want to share with you something that I believe is so impactful to your spiritual life. I believe God wants to take you one step closer to him. And I think he wants to go a little bit deeper. And so I'm going to share something in my heart that I feel like is going to stretch you a little bit, but it's going to be powerful. And so I want you with me today. I want you taking notes today because I believe God is wanting you to have this catalyst in your spiritual life to go places you have never been before. And so I'm going to need your help. I preach four services of the day. So I, my voice is straining. So I need you to talk back with me tonight. You need to encourage me. Holler back at your boy. We can do all that stuff, right? I like it when you talk back at me, all right? Can you help me tonight? Come on, night church. Come on. All right. So we're going to dive right into the text. So if you have your notes, pull them out. The holy people take notes. And it goes like this. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his father had done. Uzziah sought God during the days of Zechariah, who taught him to fear God. If you're taking notes, I want you to underline this. And as long as the king sought the guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. And as long as the king sought the guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. His fame spread even to Egypt. 
for it had become very powerful. His fame spread far and wide, for the Lord gave him marvelous help, and he became very powerful. How powerful is this little couple verses here? Uzziah, 16-year-old, passionate about God, wanted to be faithful, and he sought God. He, he prayed to God. He, he asked God every step of the way, give me guidance, give me insight, give me wisdom. I'm seeking you first. You come first. And every time he sought the counsel of God, he had the success and the obedience of God followed him everywhere he went. And that was a great thing, and I wish it would continue that way. But then you read one verse later what happens to Uzziah. But when he had become powerful, he also became proud. Or other translations say arrogant, which led to his downfall, and he sinned against the Lord his God. So Isaiah, man, I want God. I want to be passionate about God. I'm seeking God. I'm praying to God. I need his guidance. I love God. And then all of a sudden, life starts going good. And then no longer is he seeking God. He's seeking the reflection in the mirror. I'm my provider. I'm my man. I know how to do it myself. And then he lets this thing that Solomon warned us in Proverbs about, he let pride creep in. And Solomon said, you better be careful because pride leads to destruction. Better watch out because that haughtiness is going to lead to your fall. Because here's what pride says. Pride says, I'm self-sufficient. I'm my own provider. I'm the miracle worker in my life. I can do all things through I who power me. And pride lets it to be an inward focus, and it likes for itself to be puffed up. But this thing about humility says, no, I don't need self-sufficiency. I need total dependency on my God who is the guider, my God who is the strengthener, my God who is the creator, my God who is omnipresent, my God who is all wisdom, my God who created the earth with just speaking out of his mouth, my God who formed me with his very own hands and breathed his breath inside of me, my God who said, I know a purpose for you. You can't even comprehend it yet, but it's greater than you can ever imagine. That's who I humble myself for because I need that in my life because here's what pride does pride leads you to act never pray humility leads you to pray before you ever act if you don't understand this you're going to miss so much that God has for you that's why David said something very important also in our reading text in Psalm 23 he said it like this he says the Lord is my shepherd I have all that I want the Lord is my shepherd. I'm not the shepherd, I'm the sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't lead the shepherd, I don't guide the shepherd, I don't give the shepherd wisdom, I don't give the shepherd strength. The Lord is my shepherd, he's my guide, he's my leader, he's my strength when I'm weak, he's my protection when I feel all alone, he's the one that takes me to the places I want. And when I understand that I surrender to my God because he's leading me, I have all that I need. Not some of what I need. Not every once in a while God's gonna throw you a bone. Not everyone wants, well, hey, maybe something good will happen to you. He says that when I understand that the art of surrender and humbling myself before God, every time I get what I need, every time I have all that I need. That's why the very next chapter, David said it like this. He will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him, who seek the face of of God. Such is the generation that seeks the face of God. They'll receive the blessings that they can never buy in this world. They're going to receive righteousness you can't get from this world. Such is the generation that seeks the face of God, what he wants to do in and through you. Such is the generation that is desperate for God. Because like it says in Chronicles, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Such is my people that doesn't have an if in the statement of if my people will pray, but are the people that gets on their hands and on their knees, and on their face before God, and say, God, only you, I need only you. I'm desperate for all that you have for me. Such is the people that receive the blessings of God. But the problem is, is that's not where we get find ourselves. The 
problem is, is God's attention is not what we seek. The problem is, is we find ourselves seeking the world over we find ourselves seeking God. The problem is, is we think the blessings that God speaks about in the scripture aren't really factual statements. We believe they're more emotional fluff pieces. They make you feel good in a moment, right? We like it when a pastor will say one of these statements, right? We like when the pastor gets his voice a little bit louder, right? And he gets into it, right? Because all y'all, mm, amen, pastor. Preach. My hanky is waving right now. Come on. We like these goosebump moments. But the problem is, is we can't take these as emotional fluff pieces. We have to take them at face value. Because what happens is, is when life doesn't go the way you plan, and it won't always, and you're faced with a problem or a tragedy or a situation in your life, you have a choice. Do I trust God and be obedient or do I seek the rationality of this world? Do I believe that the word of God is yes and amen or do I believe the word of man is yes and amen? And in doing so, many times we choose the world over God. Not because we're evil people, not because we're bad people, but it's because that's what's always has our attention. That's what we're focused on. That's what we're seeking. We're seeking things outward instead of things that are upward. And we wonder why we end up spiritually bankrupt. Because here's what I know, if you're taking notes, write this down. What gets your attention gets your heart. And that determines the course of your life. What gets your attention in life, what takes up the majority of your time, what is your priority in life? That's going to get your heart. And what grabs a hold of your heart is going to direct your life. You will end up where you place the most priority in. You're going to end up what you prefer most in this world. And we live in a world that is vying for our attention. And we're vying for it. We live in a world that is addicted to the wrong kind of attention. We live in a world that we are so obsessed with how many likes we get and how many hearts we get and how many retweets we get, how many views we get, and we become obsessed with it. We get a little crazy with it. Like, we get a little loony with it. Like, we'll go on Pinterest, right, and we'll find this really crazy cool, like, recipe. We'll go on there and we'll be like, mm-hmm, I'm going to make those, right? I'm going to get me that gluten-free, homemade, peach with nutmeg infused caramelized pancakes with that homemade cinnamon vanilla maple syrup. And I'm going to pour it all over there. And I'm going to put a dollop of heavy whipped cream on there with some sprinkles of some cinnamon and the drizzle of the caramel. And it's going to look good. And then I'm going to get me a plate and I'm going to set it on my table. And I'm going to get the fork just right and the knife just right. And then I'm going to get the napkin just right. And then I'm I'm going to stand on top of a chair and I'm going to take a picture. Oh, got to bring that lamp in here, right? I'm going to take that picture and then I'm going to go on Instagram, get that right filter game on there, and then I'm going to go hashtag nom nom. Hashtag fatty in the house. Hashtag it going down, right? And then we post it. And then we sit down and eat the pancakes, and within two minutes, we looking on our Instagram. Who's liked it? Who hearted it, right? Who got my, because we crave that more than we did them pancakes. We want to feed ourselves on that attention more than we want to feed ourselves on what we just made. Or you know what else we do? We do that inspirational selfie game. You know what I'm talking about. It's when you take a selfie and you think, dang, I look good. But then all of a sudden you go, I can't look vain. I know I'm going to post a really inspirational quote or scripture there with my picture. Ain't got nothing to do with the picture. But they going to think I am inspirational. Now, nah, we all know you think your highlighter look good and your makeup's on point. Don't even be fooling yourself. Why is that? Because we like to be liked. We crave attention. And listen to me, those things aren't wrong. It's not wrong to want to be liked. And it's not wrong to want attention. 
But the problem is, is we crave the wrong kind of attention more than we crave the attention of God. We care more about a thousand little likes out in the world than we care about the one like from our God in heaven. We spend more time seeking what we can find on the screen than when we do in the presence of God. We spend more time cultivating our emotions than we do cultivating the presence of God in our life. And then we wonder why we're struggling and spiritually we're bankrupt. And then we wonder why our identity is starting to fall away because we've lost all authenticity because we spend our time scrolling and checking out everybody's Facebook feeds and all their Instagram and all of a sudden then we go I'm not as good as them and all of a sudden we start saying you know what they got better dreams than me you know they don't got flaws like I do they got a nicer car than I got they got nicer houses than me God made a mistake with me why couldn't God make me like them? Why couldn't God create me like that? Why did I have to grow up in the house that I had to grow up in? Why did I have to have come from the educational background that I came from? Why did I have to be married to a person that treated me like that? Why did I have to be this color race? Why can't I be like that? And we play this comparison game. And we start comparing our everyday life to their online highlight reel. Then we start saying, God, I don't want to be who you created me to be. I want to be who you created them to be. And we trade our authenticity and identity down the road. And we think they're perfect. Can I be honest with you? Ain't nobody perfect. Jesus is the only one that's perfect, and I ain't seen him showing his face around here in 2,000 years, okay? I know some of y'all think I'm like him, but I'm not, I promise, okay? Just ask my wife. Her hanky's waving right now. She's like, come on, somebody. Right, you get on there, and you go, oh, man, look at the pastor. Pastor Mike and his wife, look at the cutest little family, right? They on the beach taking pictures, family pictures. Look how happy they are. You don't know how many times we screamed at our kids, you better smile or you in trouble, right? Come on, somebody. I got my arms. It's not lovely around my kids. I'm pitching their back. You better smile. It's hit or down, right? Let's just be real. You got to understand who you're created to be. See, this is why you need to get this. Write this in your notes. Because misplaced attention will lead to false sense of happiness. If all you're doing is looking outward for your joy and not upward for your purpose, you're going to find yourself with a false sense of happiness. Why do I tell you all that? Because if you think you can find fulfillment in this world, it's a lie, it's a myth, and it's a facade. It's about as real as 90% of the things you find online. It's highlights with all the flaws removed, masquerading as reality. You won't find fulfillment in this world apart from your God. And this is why prayer is so important. This is why a prayer life is so important. Because a prayer life says, God, I'm desperate for your affection. I'm desperate for your attention. I'm desperate for your affirmation. And God, I'm humbling myself to this point where I say, God, I know I can't do it by myself. And I know you're wiser than me and you're stronger than me and you have a bigger sense of purpose than me. And I realize that in my weakness, you're made strong. And so I come to you every single day. I come to you on my knees. I come to you sometimes with tears. So I come to you sometimes with praise. I come to you how I am in the most authentic, raw moments because I realize I need you, your grace, your mercy, your praise, your blessings, your faith your direction, your guidance. I don't need the attention of this world. I need the attention of my God. I don't need what this world can offer. I need heaven colliding with my earth, earth with me right now. I need what heaven can give and provide. And that's what it does. And so what we're going to talk about very quickly, I'm going to hurry really quickly because I spent a little bit longer on the intro. Are you okay with that night church? I'm sorry. Sometimes I just get going. Night church has got such a good energy. Come on. But we're going to talk about a prayer really quick. And listen to me, prayer is not the word you recite. It's the mindset you frame your life around. 
And I want you to frame your mind around a life-giving mindset. And so we're going to uh, talk about a prayer. It's actually found in one verse, and it's called the Jabez Prayer. And it says it like this. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hands be with me. Keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. One verse, that's pretty good. But he's saying four things in there that is so vital. And they build off of each other. And it's so simple, but it's so effective. Why? Because faith is simple. Faith is, I hear the word of God, I believe the word of God, and I will receive the word of God. I hear the word of God, I believe the word of God, I will receive the word of God. It's pretty simple like that. And so what Jabez is saying, he says, I'm getting my mind right. So the very first thing he says is, God, would you bless me? But what he's really saying is this, write this in your notes. God, that we will walk in favor. God, I want to walk in favor. Because what the word blessings here is, is it's the Hebrew word barak. And barak means much more than physical blessings. The word barak actually means that God's going to bestow favor, and he's going to bestow a status, and he's going to bestow special possessions on you. So what it means is, is that God's going to give you favor with himself. And when he gives you favor with himself, he's going to elevate you, not to what this world has called you, but to the identity that he has called you, to a special role, a special place. And not only that, but he's going to give you a special possessions, which means special giftings and a special calling that you can't get out of this world, but can only come from the anointing of God. So what he's saying is, God, give me your favor. And this is the type of favor that David would literally fill the Psalms with. He would pray for Barak over and over again. God, I want favor. When he was a little boy in a field, and God, and he thought he was all abandoned and nobody wanted him. And even his father goes, you don't want him to be king. I got better sons. But Samuel said God picked him because he doesn't judge by the outer appearance, but by the heart. That was Barak. When he stood in that field, and a lion and a bear tried to devour him and take away his sheep, and he fought them with his bare hands, and he beat them with a club to death, that that was Barak, the favor of God. When he stood before a giant that wanted to devour the entire nation of Israel and everyone shook in their boots, but he stood at that giant and he said, I'm going to call you what you are, an uncircumcised Philistine who's about to lose his head. That was Barak, the favor of God. When a father-like figure in his life betrayed him and tried to hunt him down for dead, yet he was protected by God. That was Barak, the favor of God. When his own son betrayed him, and raised up an army to take him off the throne and murder his father. But God protected him and guided him. That was Barak. That was favor. And when the city, the nation of Israel prospered under his reign, that was Barak. That was favor. So when David talks about favor, I perk up a little bit. Because his life wasn't perfect, but it was filled with favor. If you want a perfect life, you got to wait till heaven. But if you want favor, start grasping what David's got. That's why David said it like this in Psalms. He says, come on. He says, surely the Lord will bless the righteous. Surround them with favor like a shield. I like that imagery, right? Because he's like, it's going to surround me like a shield, the favor of God. So when the world tries to take my dreams, God surrounds me like a shield. When people try to attack my character, it's going to surround me like a shield. When I start hit with tragedy and it tries to take away my faith, it's going to surround me like a shield. Because you can try your best shot, but you cannot penetrate the favor of God on my life. It's going to surround me like a shield. And that's why he says in Psalms 84, 11, he goes, watch this. He says, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Get this in your heart and mind. God doesn't withhold anything that was already promised to you. If he has ordained it, if he's already prophesied it, if he's written it in the word of God, if it's a covenant, it cannot be broken. He don't withhold it from you. You withhold it from yourself by refusing to trust him. You withhold it from yourself by seeking the world, not the face of God. You withhold it from yourself because you're chasing after things that are fleeting and temporary. But if you can get on your hands and knees and seek the eternal God, the eternal covenant, that's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he ain't withholding it from you. Why? Because he 
loves you. That's the point of prayer. It's to get in his mindset, my God loves me. He seeks me. He desires me. That's why James says, don't be misled. Don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. You go through trials, don't be misled. You got to fight with your spouse, don't be misled. You feel like you're on unshaky grounds at your job, don't be misled. That tragedy feels like it's ripping your heart out, don't be misled. Because whatever's good and perfect is a gift coming down from God our Father, who chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. Don't let this world rob you of what you were ordained to have. You out of all the creations are his prized possession. The millions of angels that worship him 24-7 don't hold a candle to you. All the creation of this world, the beauties of the sunsets and the mountains that pierce through the heavens and the oceans and the beaches don't compare to your praise and your prayers. You are special. You've got to understand this. That's why a fulfilled life is knowing that God always has our best interest at heart. Why do you start with understanding the favor of God when you pray? Because you've got to know when you go to God in prayer, he's fighting for you, not against you. You've got to know he's on your side. And you've got to know that he only wants your best interest at heart. God loves you. So Jabez prays for God's favor. And then he makes a statement, God, that you will enlarge my territory or expand my territory. And basically what he's saying here is, God, multiply my impact. Multiply my impact. Watch what Jabez does here. He doesn't pray for God's blessings and then hoards it. He doesn't pray for God's blessings and say, I'm going to store it in a bank. He prays for God's blessings and says, give me more now so I can do more for your kingdom. God, expand my territory. Give me more influence. Give me more responsibility. Give me more impact. Let me reach farther than I can reach myself because I want to touch people more with your blessings and with your favor. I want the world to experience what I've experienced. I want other people to experience what I've experienced because I can't hoard what God's done in my life. Because here's what you have to understand. Write this in your notes. Life will never make sense unless you live a life bigger than yourself. If you live for you, you're going to kill you. If you're trying to feed yourself, you're going to starve yourself. Because we were never intended to hoard our salvation. We were intended to pour our salvation out. If you try to hold on to the gifts of God and the blessings of God, they will grow stale and stagnant in your life. But when you give the things of God away, they become activated and multiplied in your life. That if you give grace and mercy to someone who desperately needs grace and mercy, it becomes activated in your life and multiplied in your life. So when condemnation tries to creep into your mind, all of a sudden it realizes that dude's got an army of grace and mercy in his heart and mind. I'm going to tuck tail and run. When you give peace beyond understanding to someone who desperately needs peace, it becomes activated and multiplied in your life. And when you start seeing anxiety and stress and struggle try to come into your mind, all of a sudden it realizes it cannot overcome the peace beyond understanding in your heart and mind when you give joy that's in your life to someone else it becomes activated and multiplied and all of a sudden when sadness and depression and heartache tries to creep up in your life they realize you got the joy that cometh in the morning and they leave your life running for the hills because we are not meant to hoard we're meant to pour and you need to activate the things of God in your life. And it's not a suggestion. It's a command. Jesus said it like this. Acts 1 says like this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Notice this. You're receiving something coming upon you. And then his very next statement. And you'll be my witness. Telling people about me everywhere. Notice that. You receive and then you give the very commands of Jesus. You've got to get that in your heart and mind and understand who you are. All right, I'm going to move on really quickly. Number three. So Jabez says, God, I want your anoint, I want your blessings, I want your favor. 
Then he prays, God, I want you to enlarge my territory and in my influence. And then he says, let the hand of God be upon me. And what he's saying is that I become filled with the anointing of God. God, I want to be filled with your anointing. I don't want my talent and charisma to influence people. I want the anointing of God to influence people. See, something happens when we receive the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Our sins don't cover, or we're not covered up anymore, but they are completely washed clean and gone. And we have the abilities to step into the presence of God and experience things from God we could never experience on our own. Paul says it like this, and I want to read this verse. Watch this. No, the wisdom we speak of is a mystery of God. We don't really quite understand how it works. His plan what was previously hidden. This was before Jesus. Even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. This word glory here is really powerful. It's the Hebrew word Shabbat. C-H-A-B-A-D. And it actually means the full weight of God resting on you. That God wants the full weight of who he is to rest upon you. He wants the full weight of all that he can do in your life to rest upon you. He doesn't want the weight of this world to rest upon you. He doesn't want the status of this world to rest upon you. He wants the full weight of all that he is to rest upon you. And he goes on to say it like this. Watch this. But the rulers of this world had not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified the glorious Lord. What he's saying is if people knew what Jesus really wanted to give them, they wouldn't have crucified him. They're like, nah, we should keep this dude around. Like, he, he got some good stuff. But this is what the scriptures mean when they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And this is what you have to understand. Watch this. You cannot produce a life for yourself greater than the destiny God has for you. When he says no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has comprehended, it means you physically can't grasp what God wants to do in your life. Your emotions can't comprehend what God wants to do in your life. Your body, your lust, your cravings, they can't even be satisfied. They can't even think that there could be a satisfaction that that's great, right? When your lust is craving and your greed is growing, it can't even imagine that there could be something more that could satisfy you. And your emotions can't even comprehend that you can have joy and fulfillment and peace greater than what you're trying to grasp in this world. It can't even matter. But guess what? We're not made up of just a mind. And we're not made up of just a body. We're made up of a soul. And when we let the soul be in charge of our life, we experience something more. Because Paul goes on to say it like this, watch this. But it was that God revealed these things by his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. So when we start praying on a regular basis and seeking the presence of God and cultivating what God wants in our lives, all of a sudden our Holy Spirit in our soul starts whispering, Psst, I've got a destiny for you. i got freedom for you. i got strength you can't muster up in this world. And the more we seek him, the more we seek him, you're no longer a slave to sin, but you are free through Christ Jesus. The more we seek him, you're not an accident, you're not a mistake, but you have a purpose, and this world will be a better place because you're in it. The more we're praying, and the more we seek it, the more he's whispering, there is redemption in your life. There is restoration in your life. Your marriage has hope. Your children are coming back home. You can live a life of purpose. You don't have to be addicted no longer. You can walk in freedom, and the more we seek, the more he speaks, because we did not receive a spirit from this world. We received it from God, and he wonderful things he freely gives us. So what we're doing is saying, Holy Spirit, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I don't want my emotions to be the Lord of my life. I don't want my flesh and my, my urges to be the Lord of my life. I don't want my stresses to be the Lord of my life. I don't want people to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be Lord of my life. So you're saying, God, I want your favor. Then I want an influence. And then I want that influence to be impacted not by myself, but by your anointing. Because I can't change people. I can't save people, only you can. And then his last thing he says is that God, protect us. Protect us. 
Because here's the kicker. That devil ain't going to like it that you're seeking God. He's going to come after you to still kill and just destroy the things in your life. The devil don't care if you go to heaven. He don't want you taking anybody with you. And when you're living a life like this, you're taking a bunch of people with you to heaven. And I heard it kind of said like this. If you don't ever face the devil, it's probably because you're walking in the same direction he's going, right? You ain't ever crossing paths. But if you're seeking God like this, you're going to butt heads with this dude. He's going to try to mess up your life. He's going to try to mess up your family. You may be in here right now like, Pastor, you need to be a little bit more positive. Okay, I'm positive. Devil coming after you. All right, we good? Okay. Because it's going to happen. Because here's what I know. Watch what Paul says. I don't know why I always go there with a pastor. I, nobody talks to me with that kind of accent, but that's, kind of, that's what I go with. All right, so that's your, that's your all. Some of y'all will be self-conscious right now. You're like, I don't talk. Like, okay. Night church, we can have fun, right? It's the right church. All right, come on. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. See, the reality is, is that he wants to blind you from seeing the things that God has for you. Paul says it's like a veil going over your heart and mind. And he's going to use things that try to blind you. He's going to use doubt. He's going to use fear. He's going to use judgment. He's going to use lust or sin or temptations. He's going to use gossip. Because what he's trying to do is get your heart and mind covered so you can't see the life that God has for you. And so when... Jabez is praying that God protect him. What he's saying is, God, let me see what you want me to see. Expose the lies that I've been believing. Expose the things that don't need to be in my life so I can be solely attached to you. And the writer of Hebrews said it best like this. Watch this. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run the race with endurance that God has set before us. So how do we do that? By keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. That when you're seeking God in prayer, day in and day out, your eyes are locked on Jesus. When you have a prayer life, not a prayer occurrence, your eyes is locked on Jesus. And then all of a sudden he starts initiating something in your spirit and you start realizing, I can be more than what I am. I'm not what people have said I am. I can be more than what I'm experiencing. And then all of a sudden you realize, Oh, wait, he's the champion. He's not the runner-up. He didn't come in second place. He literally defeated death, hell, the grave, and all the sin that's wrapped up in it. And he kicked Satan's teeth down his throat. And he's going to raise my hand with the victorious right hand. Because I understand that God, God is for me. So what can ever be against me? But it comes with daily keeping your eyes locked on Jesus. I don't have time to go over this scripture, but it's a really good scripture. So if it's not in your notes, write it down because it's really good. But I want you to leave you with this thought. Prayer must be a compass that guides us, not a flare gun to rescue us. Because that's what we tend to use it for. God, I'm in mess, man. Come save me. I need a miracle. Get me out of this. I promise you, you fix this, I'll never do it again, right? How many people said that, right? That's not the way prayer was intended to be. Prayer is not intended to be a flare gun to save you. It's meant to be a compass to guide you through this thing called life. And he's going to take you on the path that he's designed you to be on. But you've got to let prayer be active in your daily life. So let me give you a take home and get you out of here. Number one, number one, Get a plan. You know why most people don't pray? Because they say, Pastor Mike, I don't know what to say. I don't know scripture like you know scripture. I can't so those, say those fancy words like you say all the time because you are such a genius. Like, come on, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Well, guess what? You come to 21 days of prayer, I'm going to hook you up. We got prayer guys we're going to give everybody. And they're awesome. They're filled with all these different types of prayers. The Jabez prayers in here and so much more. 
get a plan, man. You don't have to go at this thing alone. Get a guide to instruct and get in your life. Number two, I want you to be consistent. Prayer is not an occurrence. It's never an every once in a while thing. It's an everyday thing. Listen to me. God is the breath in your lungs, but prayer is the inhale to take that breath in there. Let God be what God is in your life, but you need prayer to bring it in. Okay? So it needs to be consistent. And lastly, shameless plug, be a part of 21 Days of Prayer. Come on, somebody. But why do I say that? Because it takes 21 days to build a habit. What's a greater habit than to have a power of prayer life with God? And I would love for you to be here at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. We got the coffee brewing. It'll be hot and tasty. And we're going to seek the presence of God. Amen. Very quickly before I end, I want to end with what's most important. Because there's some people in this room right now who said, Pastor Mike, what you said is great, man, it's awesome. You're talking about power. You're talking about the identity in God. You're talking about God moving in your life. You're talking about God speaking to you. But I don't know God the way you do. I don't have a relationship with God like you. I don't have that connection. Maybe you never have. Maybe you've never been to church. Maybe this is kind of new to you. Maybe you're like, man, that dude, they get crazy on tonight church. Well, that's cool. But maybe you used to have a relationship with God, but you've walked away. Maybe you started living for this world more than you lived for God to the point you just kind of walked away from God. But you realize you need to come back home. This is a choice I can't make for you. And this is a choice God won't make for you. Because you got to make this choice yourself. Because true love is never forced, it's chosen, and God wants you to choose him. But if you want to choose him tonight, all you have to do is, with your mouth, say, God, I need your forgiveness. I want you part of my life, and I give you my life. And then you just got to believe in your heart that he hears your prayers. Why? Because he's not rotting away in some grave. He's the resurrected king sitting at the right hand of God, hearing your prayers and interceding on your behalf. Quit running away from your God. Run to your God tonight. And so we're all going to pray that prayer together. So if I get everybody to bow your head, nobody looking around. Take your hand and place it over your heart. It's a symbol of your soul. And repeat after me, dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. And I believe your blood washes away all my sins. Come be a part of my life. I am forgiven. I am chosen. I matter. And I am so incredibly glad you joined us online today. If you made that commitment to Jesus for the first time, or maybe you recommitted your life to Jesus, we would love to hear from you and celebrate with you. If you could just email us at connect at bloomhere.org or leave a comment below, we would love to share this moment with you. If you've been blessed by today and God really just spoke to you and you want to take that next step to financially contribute to our church, we would love for you to help fuel the ministry. And all you can do is go to bloomhere.org slash give. You can give a one-time gift or set up reoccurring giving like I do. Make sure your tithe and offering always comes first. But we want to continue to fuel the work in the ministry as we want to see more lives change, more people growing up passionate about Jesus and seeing families redeemed and restored. If you'd also like to connect with us on any social media platform, you can do that at Church Bloom on all Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Guys, I cannot wait to see you next week. And if you're ever in the Branson area, we'd love for you to join us live at one of our five Sunday services. Love you guys. Pray God. Peace.